So welcome everybody. As people come in, we're gonna go ahead and get started so that we uh, move through this on time. Thank you for coming in on your Saturday to join us for this training for UCC churches um, on serving Afghan refugees in particular and in general understanding the refugee and migration program part of the United Church of Christ National Ministries. Uh, my name is Irene Willis Hassan. I am the Minister for Refugee and Migration Services on Team Global Hope. Global Hope is a relatively new team to the United Church of Christ National Ministries. And our goal is to connect churches and partnerships that are involved with humanitarian um, uh, projects such as disaster ministries, refugee and migration ministries, and volunteer ministries. So we look forward to working with all of you, and um, we are so grateful for the partnerships with many of you that we already have. So before we go ahead and get started, I wanted to uh, go ahead and uh, invite us into a time of prayer because we know that this is a heavy day that we've chosen to have this webinar on, and we want to invite space for this to be a time of discernment. So please enter a um, period of prayer with me. Creator God, we lift up to you our collective mourning on this day, September 11th, 2021 the 20th anniversary of those devastating events that changed the world as we know it. We ask you to hold close the families of those lost on that day. We ask you to wrap in holy tenderness the families of the lives lost in the resulting 20 years of war that followed. We hold in gratitude the soldiers that fought and died in Afghanistan, as well as the veterans who came back forever changed by their experiences in America's longest war. We also place before you the lives lost of the Afghans in the midst of that conflict and mourn for all of those who have been displaced, those who live in fear and anxiety of an unknown future. We hold in gratitude all the Afghan nationals who risked their lives to serve with our military. We ask for your forgiveness for grave mistakes that we have made as a nation. As we recognize together in this moment of enormity of the devastation we saw on that fateful September morning 20 years ago and the tumultuous journey that followed, we ask that you bring us wisdom for how we can honor you, your justice, your compassion, and your transformative power moving forward. Please instill in us the, the strength to change the story, the courage to heal in your name for that which has been broken, and discernment to carve a renewed path of dignity and hope. Call us into action in your service to walk alongside those impacted. Create in us new hearts that are closer to yours so that we may participate in the redemption that is possible through you in the wake of this heaviness we hold on to this anniversary day. Amen. Uh, so, um, Becca, if you don't mind moving on to the next slide, I want to go over a couple housekeeping issues before we get started. Uh, that this webinar is being recorded and it'll be archived in our webinars on our UCC national page. Uh, there's the link in the chat box. We do encourage you to interact and ask questions. And the way that you're going to do that is there is a Q&A bar at the bottom of the screen. Um, I'm assuming if you're on the Zoom call, you may have used Zoom before. Um, if not, and you don't understand how to use a Q&A panel, you can ask Becca Choate in the chat um, about how to use the Q&A. But the Q&A function will be for the questions that will be submitted to panelists that they will answer afterward after their presentations. Questions that are put in the chat box will not be answered after the initial questions of asking Becca how to use the Q&A. We do encourage you, and I see that you are already using the chat box to introduce yourself with your name, your location, your contact info, and what vision you have for a refugee and migration ministry that you'd like to start in your church or one that you already have. Okay, thank you. Next slide. So this, uh, this session is going to be informational. However, there is plenty of information out there already, um, particularly with our partners at Church World Service. 
This is a screenshot of Church World Services website, and there's also a link to it that Becca's going to drop. Thank you, Becca. She dropped it in the chat. And that will give you very comprehensive information that's up to date on the situation with Afghan refugees and what's going on with Afghanistan and how you can help. Now, we will, like I said, we will be offering information on Afghanistan today and the Afghan refugees, um, but mostly we, we want to use this time to introduce you to our refugee and migration ministries so that you are able to serve an Afghan family or another refugee family or an asylum seeking family um, and do so effectively with the resources that you have in your local context and also what we can offer you from UCC National Ministries. So um, before we move on, I'd like to introduce, introduce you to Errol Kekik, who is the uh, Senior Vice President of Church World Service, who will give um, some information about specifically Afghan refugees and the up-to-date um, information about what's going on at this time. So I'm handing over to you, Errol. Thank you for coming. Many thanks indeed, Irene. And uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, good evening, everybody. And thank you very much for letting me join your meeting today. As uh, Irene suggested, we um, have uh, Church World Service been working on uh, Afghan response for quite some time in this, at this moment. And uh, it is a pleasure to share the update with you tonight. You will know that uh, the Afghan caseload is not a new caseload for us. We have been working with the recipients of the special immigrant visa and Afghan refugees for over a a decade closer to 15 years at this point in time. What is different at this moment is just the sheer volume of cases that have been evacuated from Kabul and uh, that are now coming to the United States. Of some 120,000 people that have been evacuated from Kabul, uh, 24,000 roughly more or less have already arrived into the United States and are currently either already in our communities or are at military bases. At this point in time, we have about uh, 10 military bases that have come forward to serve this population. What is different at this point in time is that um, we have seen the recipients of the special immigrant visa, meaning people who have worked with the US government, either military, state department, or in other military or other government installation over a period of time. Um, come to our communities, and uh, they have been served through what we know as the U.S. Refugee Admission Program. In order to accommodate the urgency of the moment and to allow a larger group of people to come in at this point in time, the government has exercised its um, right to uh, allow and grant humanitarian parole to a large number of people that are coming in. What that means is that people are entitled to enter the United States legally, but are not entitled to any benefits. That means that they're not entitled to any refugee-like assistance uh, as, as special immigrant visa holders are. And that complicates our response very much because we're resettling a large number of people into um, a community or communities that have been affected by COVID-19 uh, without any health insurance. And that's certainly a, a huge concern for, for all of us. Now, every single individual that goes to a military base is um, uh, subject to a medical exam. And uh, every individual who is in a military base is also offered a set of vaccination, including COVID-19. There are, however, people who leave the airport before they get to the military base, and uh, we uh, refer to those individuals as walk-ins because they just walk into one of our offices and in communities where we serve and seek services. Regretfully, the government has not yet at this point in time found the right way to serve people who have bypassed the military base and uh, have gone to join their, uh, their relatives, meaning that each and every individual who has done that has to be uh, subsequently enrolled in the program that we are running, and there isn't a mechanism to do that yet. So we're working very closely with the, um, with the federal government and their institutions to, to find a way to, uh, to, to continue to serve the people who have left 
the airport and have now shown up in one of our locations. And we are preparing to receive about 2,000 individuals a week um, for the next period of time. And we don't know what a period of time is um, between the nine national resettlement agencies. That means that Church World Service will receive its share, which could be based upon uh, its percentage allocation of cases that uh, we would receive. It could also be based upon preferences that people have uh, as to where they wish to go and where we have affiliates. Thus far, a large swath of this population has gone to Northern California, Sacramento area, Northern Virginia and Washington DC, as well as Dallas metropolitan area in Texas. I will um, be very honest with you and say that we expect that uh, this population is likely to go to all 50 states very quickly. And uh, we think that uh, this will happen within next few weeks. So I would not propose uh, or suggest that uh, any one location in this country would likely not see any Afghan arrivals. Initially, we were offered um, a planning program and planning um, figure of 50,000 arrivals within six months. That has since last Tuesday changed to 75,000. And those of you who followed the news may have seen that uh, Washington Post has reported on Friday that uh, it appears that at this moment, uh, the figure is up to 95,000 individuals uh, only to be revised in October. So we are basically looking at a massive rescue and receive welcome operation that we haven't had in this country since probably 1979 or 1980. And we're trying to mobilize every resource and every individual in this country who is willing to help at this moment in time to help us navigate this difficult task. The government has now officially named the former governor of um, the state of Delaware to be the refugee coordinator amongst uh, the government agencies and uh, we have met with this individual over the last week uh, a couple of times and uh, have planned for the expansion of the current network that we have. But I think it's fair to say that uh, the expectation and the reality on the ground will likely change within the next week or two again, so that we are going to be receiving Afghan refugees and they are refugees for all practical purposes, despite of their um, current legal status uh, over, the, over the 50 states over the next six months or so. Our biggest needs at this point in time are dual. One end is the legal status that people have because they have been admitted in on the or under the authority that the Department of Homeland Security has uh, to grant humanitarian parole. As I mentioned earlier, they're ineligible for refugee-like services, including refugee cash and medical assistance. Um, people will need every ounce of assistance that we can offer to cover their medical needs and their, um, their cash needs, specifically looking at housing. Um, we are working with the federal government to, to try to push the administration to exercise their authority to issue executive orders, to look at uh, precedents such as the Cuban Haitian Interim Program, to grant refugee-like status to people, which would then entitle them to benefits. And we're working with members of Congress to encourage them to uh, to do two things. One is to enact the anomaly request that the federal government, the administration has submitted this past week, which would allocate enough money to federal government agencies to serve this population through the continuing resolution mechanism. And we're trying to uh, push the Congress and the members of Congress to, um, to, to create a uh, Afghan Adjustment Act, which is akin to a Cuban Adjustment Act, which would basically allow people who have been admitted through this process to bypass 
uh, the uh, asylum process as we know it, because we would basically be adding about 100,000 people to the asylum backlog, which is already miles long, uh, instead of creating a mechanism that will allow them to adjust their status to legal permanent residency much sooner than that. And um, uh, at this point in time, we are hopeful that Congress would um, act uh, as quickly as the end of this month and create such uh, opportunity for people, but we will need your help to make sure that you call your representatives and you, your, your senators to, uh, to let them know that you're really concerned about this population and that you wish to uh, encourage them to, uh, to take action on this front. In the interest of time, I'm going to stop right there, Irene, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much again. Thank you so much, Errol. Um, Becca, it looks like there, there is a question for Errol. Why don't we go ahead and pull that one up right now so that Errol can be free to go if he needs to at any point. Oh, never mind, it looks like maybe it was answered. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I moved it because we said we were gonna be answering it live. So would you like me to read it, Irene? Or how, would you, how do you wanna do that? Yeah, I mean, is that one for Errol, that question? Um, I think, yeah. Okay, yeah, go ahead, go ahead and read that one out for him. Um, so there's a question from Michelle McFadden that says, I have a bedroom, bathroom, and den to share with a female Afghan refugee with or without a child or two. A friend will be living in the same house upstairs several months for free, but I live in a very conservative city with few people of color. Is it still a good idea to house her? Thank you for that question, Michelle. Uh, we're certainly hopeful that we will be able to utilize generous offers of help such as this one in short order. Uh, we encourage you and everybody else in this call to continue to, uh, to put these offers forward. Uh, at this moment, I do not have a clear roster of people that are coming in. And as soon as we do, we will certainly share that with UCC and they can, uh, they can make sure that you have that information. Uh, we certainly truly appreciate your, your generous offer. Thank you. I wanna echo that. Thank you, Errol. Um, that, that is a really important resource and this training is, is to help equip you to use that resource effectively. Um, and that I will serve as a point of contact for you to, to get that ball rolling because Errol and others in Errol's position are going to be um, keeping us updated on the situation as it moves forward, as it progresses. So yes, thank you, that is, that is useful and I will be in touch with you. Um, all right, uh, thank you again, Errol. We appreciate all of uh, your knowledge and taking the time to, to share it with us. Becca, you can go ahead and go on to the next slide. Thanks very so, much. So I wanted to share uh, shortly about um, Afghan immigrants in general. And I use the term immigrants because as Errol described, the situation is a bit unusual. We have been resettling Afghan SIVs, special immigrant visas for years. And again, these folks are, are folks that served the US military while their presence was in Afghanistan, basically in exchange for refugee visas because they risked their lives and the lives of their families by um, providing that service. So they get special visas to come to the United States. Often those folks, because their job are to be interpreters for the US military, they have excellent English. Um, and they also come with uh, careers and advanced degrees. A lot of them have degrees that were useful and utilized by the US military. For example, supply chain management, business management, um, things like this, uh, accountants, lawyers, they have all sorts of advanced degrees that they come over with from their work with the US military. And that creates a um, special problem for Afghan SIVs, and this also applies to Iraqi SIVs as well, is that they often feel frustrated when they get to the United States because they can't use those degrees here. They aren't seen as valid. So a person who has been an accountant in Afghanistan their whole life comes over here and they don't have their CPA. Um, 
and by American standards. So they can't be an accountant. And then the refugee office that resettles them expects them to go be a security guard or a janitor or another menial position that has nothing to do with the identity of their past. And so that's often a point of frustration for Afghan refugees in particular. This isn't true of all refugee populations. This is, this is unique to, to these type of SIV populations. Now, just because the, um, the, SI, the main SIV, the interpreter, has excellent English, that doesn't necessarily mean their family does. So let's say it's a husband, it's not always a husband, uh, comes over with his wife and four kids. The wife and four kids don't necessarily know English, which poses problems for the wife working, the wife integrating, uh, the children going to school. So there is still a need for English, but in general, with the, with the individual who has been the interpreter, the main problem that they face coming to the United States is the utility of, of their identity, of their, of their career. Um, and one way that churches can really help that refugee offices are not equipped to do a lot of the time is to help this particular population um, get to their professional goals about how they can get things like their licensure in America, how they can get networked into the jobs that they that they hope for. Um, and so that's something that churches can really do because refugee offices are not contracted to do that. They're contracted to get them any old job. Um, and so that's one way that you could really help is to offer English to the families or to help the interpreter themselves find their, um, their career goals. Also unique to this circumstance is um, that standardized, so when, when a refugee comes to the United States, um, they go through three levels of trauma, basically. The first trauma is the war that caused them to need to flee their country. And then usually with a refugee, they go to a neighboring country in which they claim asylum in the neighboring country. And they're usually placed into a refugee camp in that country because the neighboring country understands there's a conflict in that country. For example, in Syria, a lot of the refugee camps were in Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon. And so that's a second degree of trauma, the first trauma being the war, and the second degree of trauma being life in the refugee camp, which isn't easy, living for years in a tent um, with limited resources when your entire life has been changed. And then the third degree of trauma is when they have been efficiently processed through the refugee camp, they go to their host country. And if that's the United States or elsewhere, it's going to be radically different than their experience. And often we find that the most traumatic part of their journey is coming to the host country in which everything's different. They can't use their accounting degree anymore. They can't, uh, their, their spouse can't integrate because they don't speak English. They can't find halal food. They don't understand the bus system. They're getting scams in the mail. They don't understand that they're scams. Um, things like this, the whole world is different for them and it contains a massive degree of shock. Now in this particular situation of what's happening now, the middleman has been cut out in which they don't go, they don't, they have not, some of them have, but they have not necessarily been to a neighboring country into a refugee camp. So they've gone straight from war in crisis into their host country, which may pose a, um, a high level of trauma and PTSD and reactiveness in this particular population that when you are discerning a call to ministry with this population, knowing what resources you have to help with um, mental, emotional, and spiritual stability that are in your local context is going to be really helpful. Um, so that is very shortly uh, specialized things about Afghans in general. Every population um, has its own niches of, of um, culture and expectations about what they have or don't have when they come to the United States. And of course, every individual is different. Human beings are human beings and not everyone's the same. This is just general information. All right, Becca, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So, Two, three things that is expected of churches that our hope is that, that you'll do um, is to co-sponsor a refugee family. And by co-sponsor, I mean to partner with a refugee resettlement office um, to take on things like learning English, job training, uh, bus routes, all the things I just described. We call that co-sponsorship. Now, of course, as Errol described, um, not all, in fact, many of the folks that are coming over are actually not refugees. 
technically. They are humanitarian parolees, which puts them in a different category, which means they won't necessarily go through a refugee resettlement office. They actually end up looking more like asylum seekers in, in that um, instance. An asylum seeker is not a refugee. It's a person that's come to, the, to this country and claims that their life was in serious danger, and then they go through a process in which they are not eligible for work, they're at risk of deportation, uh, they don't have any sort of resources at all. So unfortunately, all these folks, all these Afghans on humanitarian parole are sort of closer to the asylum seeker category, but there are ways to minister with asylum, minister with asylum seekers, humanitarian parole, and refugees. Um, and of course, the humanitarian parolees are going into refugee offices seeking help, and the refugee offices aren't able to deal with them without the correct paperwork right now. So it's possible your local refugee office will have a record of parolees that have come through. Also, the refugee, the SIV refugees themselves um, probably have lots of friends and family that are coming over that are in the humanitarian parole category and can help connect you to those folks that are in humanitarian parole. All of that is to say that if you do choose to co-sponsor a family, that is to take on a family and help them find the resources they need in, in coordination with the refugee office or not, depending on whether it's a refugee or a parolee, um, there are things you need to consider. So this first slide that I have popped up on the screen, uh, thank you, Becca, is about capacity and location. So if you are not within, they expanded it to 100 miles, but if, if reasonably you're not within 50 miles of a refugee resettlement office, which are in most major metropolitan areas, it might be difficult to resettle a, um, a refugee family because they won't have access to resources they need, such as case management, uh, employment, bus routes. If you live in a rural area, it'd be much harder to resettle a refugee, but we can talk further about that if that is something that your congregation is passionate about doing. So I clicked no for this, that if you don't live within a 50 mile radius or even a hundred mile radius of a major metropolitan area, there are still things you can do. You can donate um, in-kind goods, although a refugee resettlement office in a major metropolitan area might necessarily not need those goods donated right now. They might be overwhelmed with donations. So you need to call ahead and ask and make sure that that's something they need. Um, you could also donate to the United Church of Christ Refugee Fund, which I'll put a link at the end of this, or Church World Service. Um, and then those donations will go towards resettling refugees and parolees. Um, you can also advocate to your local government office, your local congressperson, and we also have um, our good advocacy people on the call, Katie Adams and Noel Anderson, who will talk to you about how to advocate. But so those are your best options if you don't live within a refugee resettlement radius, advocacy and donation. Um, but if you are, if you are really have discerned with your congregation that you would like to help resettle a refugee, we could talk about how to do that. It's likely it'll be in partnership with a church that is within the resettlement radius. Okay, you can go to the next slide, Becca. So if you are within the resettlement radius of a refugee office, we encourage you to discern um, whether your uh, congregation would like to co-sponsor a family. Um, and I will send all this information to you in an email uh, to, um, uh, respond to this, uh, this meeting that we're having now. So you don't have to memorize everything that's on the screen. I'll send it to you. Um, but basically you could do anything from a short commitment to helping find housing for those folks, furnishing or furnishing a house or uh, paying for a month to three months to six months of rent because the parolees don't have that sort of resources right now. Or you could meet a family at the airport and transport them to their new home. These are simple things that you can do short term that will engage with the refugee family. Or if you are interested in the long-term commitment, um, we at United Church of Christ National Ministries will help walk you through that. Uh, it could be a wide range of things that you could do from teaching English, navigating transportation, uh, doing community orientation, like for example, what is a crosswalk? Not, not every country has those things. Um, healthcare orientation, what in-network means, these are special to the American context. Um, and then job training, like I said, that's going to be a really important part of Afghans particular. Um, 
or finding IDs, going to doctor's appointments, other things like that. There's a whole world of, of ways that you could help that would be hugely helpful, helpful to refugee resettlement offices that don't have the capacity to do these things. So we do invite you to discern co-sponsoring a family and we will help walk, walk you through that journey the whole way. Okay, next slide. So as you discern the way that you want to respond to um, co-sponsoring a refugee family, and it might not even necessarily be an Afghan family. So it's possible that refugee resettlement offices are overwhelmed with phone calls, particularly about the Afghans, and they might need someone to help with an Eritrean or a Somali family or um, a Guatemalan family, Haitian family that, that needs resettled as well because they're getting neglected in, in the wake of this, um, the situation that we're finding themselves in. So be flexible if you decide to co-sponsor a refugee family, but they might not necessarily be from Afghanistan, but we learn with the wind of the spirit and we move where she takes us. So the four questions you should basically ask yourself um, is that you should have a conversation with your church. We call this dual structure. So the first half of dual structure is um, having a conversation with your wider church, the whole church together on Sunday morning about, are we an immigrant welcoming church? And we have resources for that. Um, Becca, do you mind dropping the link to the toolkit in the chat? This toolkit will offer you resources about how to determine how to be an immigrant welcoming church. And, you know, ask yourself, for example, do you have other conflicts happening in the church? Do you have other ministries that are happening that um, need to take precedence right now? Because oftentimes sponsoring a refugee does take up a lot of time and energy. So being all on the same page, the whole church having a theological um unity about what about how you're going to respond if you're going to respond is really important so this, that's the first part of dual structure the second part is having a small committee of five to ten people is the recommendation who can specifically meet this need who are specifically assigned to doing this refugee ministry so one make sure that your church is all on the same page and that you are in the same theological boat for doing this and two make sure that you have can dedicate to responding to this. And in those conversations, determine what gifts and resources does my congregation offer? Do we have retirees that have a lot of time that are able to work with a refugee? Do we have young people that can move furniture? What is it exactly that you offer? Also, how do my congregational demographics impact, impact how we can engage? Are you within the resettlement radius? Um, as Michelle asked, are you in a neighborhood that is going to be welcoming to refugees in general? And that leads me to what risks am I taking and engaging that should be considered? So if you do choose to take on a refugee family, are you going to get pushback from the rest of your community? And are you prepared to um, receive that pushback? It's possible things could happen like your church will get graffitied. Um, and are you prepared to, to deal with those sort of problems? Um, and then what rewards or outcomes could potentially result from engaging in this ministry? And the rewards are many. Um, the panelists that I'm going to give you will talk to you about the ways in which joy, transformation, hope, love has really changed the, the way that their congregation has worked together from engaging in a refugee ministry, which is why we do encourage you to engage is because um, it creates such beauty and magic in the world to... Um, not just be able to serve, but to um, be engaged with people that are different than us, because we can learn and be saved by others just the same that, that we can help them. Um, so the rewards are great. Um, and also churches that have you know, healthy outreach ministries often have good vitality statistics too. So if your church is struggling to know how you're going to invite young people in, as many of our churches are, this might be a good way for you to engage if you are prepared to do so. But again, this is, this is a conversation that you should have at length with your church before making any decisions. Okay, next slide. So what resources can you expect from us on Team Global Hope? Um, so you can expect updated information about what's going on with uh, Afghans, um, because 
as Errol mentioned, it's a very unusual situation. Uh, and other migration patterns that are happening, we monitor all of them worldwide. Um, and then tailor guidance about how to engage, how to have that conversation within your church. We can help with that. Uh, we can also provide connections to local partnerships and resources and sister churches that are in your communities um, that may be able to help you um, to lift this ministry up. We also have a uh, trained network of disaster chaplains in case something does go wrong. Um, like I said, these folks that are coming over have incurred some heavy trauma and they've cut out the middle part um, which could result in, in some, some messy situations. We do have trained chaplains that can respond to that, respond to your congregation to keep you and the people that you're serving safe. We also have a partner and service database that um, Reverend Elena Larson will talk about later, and that will help streamline your ability to have a healthy ministry and get the resources you need. It'll assist you in organization, accountability. We even provide insurance. And then, of course, we offer um, grants for relevant projects. So you could apply for a grant for a project that you're doing with refugees, and we'll and we will consider it. Okay, next slide. So at this point, I'd like to go ahead and move on to our panelists. Um, the first panelist is going to be Miss C. O'Conrad. And before I mention these panelists, actually, we did have Afghans that were going to speak at this uh, at this meeting. But in further conversation with those folks, it's clear that they um, are overwhelmed with the situation and they need to take care of themselves and their families and their communities right now. So we want to give them time to rest. And instead we found panelists that um, have been in similar situations to what's going on now. So Seo Conrad, who is a refugee from Laos who was resettled by Christ Church in the uh, Christ Church United Church of Christ in Orville, Ohio in 1981. That's a very similar situation if there was a similar situation ever. Um, to, to what we're seeing now in that uh, in, in the wake of the Vietnam era. Um, and so she was resettled as a refugee, which would be similar to the SIV population. And then after that, we're going to hear a video um, from Reverend Carolyn Lambert, who couldn't be here in person. She had a family commitment and she uh, has resettled um, or her church had, had resettled dozens of refugees over the years, not refugees, asylum seekers. And because parolees kind of look more like asylum seekers than they do like refugees, uh, we thought it was important to hear from an asylum ministry as well. So we're going to get some wisdom from uh, Reverend Lambert as well. And then uh, Miss Katie Adams and also Reverend Noel Anderson are going to talk about ways that you can advocate to your local Congress people, given the most updated up-to-date information. And then finally, um, a short segment from Reverend Elena Larson, who's the Minister for Volunteer Engagement, um, to tell you about how, uh, what resources we can offer um, to help you put together a good team. So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to uh, CEO Conrad. Thank you for being here with us, CEO. Hello, hi. First of all, I'd like to thank um, everybody of United Church of Christ Ministries for having me here to tell my story. I've told my story about our family's escape many times. And um, every time I tell it, I get emotional. Um, like, you know, being said, it was really traumatizing and it still is, you know, but it, it makes me feel better to um, talk about it and tell my family's story of our um, escape from Laos. Um, I am gonna start with, um, Again, I introduced myself. My name is CEO, and that's spelled S E O. Um, uh, I was born in um, Vientiane, Laos, which is Vientiane is the cap capital of Laos. And Laos is sit Laos sits between North and South Vietnam and um, Thailand. So it's right in the middle between the two um, countries. Um, I was six years old when um, we had to escape. Like during the war, the communists came in and took over Laos. So what, uh, with my family's background, my grandpa was in the legislator office. My um, dad was uh, superintendent uh, and then of the uh, post school system and the adult education school uh, system. My mom was the uh, teacher back in Laos. So our family was pretty wealthy. I guess if you want to call it pretty wealthy, we had, you know, I had nannies, um, we had a guard, uh, our house was, you know, 
big white house. We had a guard um, at, at the, uh, the uh, at the gate, and um, we um, were pretty fortunate to um, be able to leave Laos. My dad left first in 1978 because once the communists came over and took over, um, they had uh, looked for him. And anybody that was, you know, in the higher up, uh, such say like like what he did in the school system, they 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 came looking for. Um, so he had to leave. He left and left me and my mom and my brothers and sister, you know, behind. So and he left in 1978. My mom later on in 1979 took me and my um, I there's I have seven siblings. So we all, you know, what we were told was we were going to grandma's house. So I understood at the age of six, we're going to grandma's house, not knowing what was going to, going to happen. We um, re left for grandma's house. And you know, th there's parts of the stories that I remember so well because it was so traumatic to me. What we had to do to escape was um, we had to escape at nighttime, not during the day, because if you were, you know, caught, you were shot. Um, by the um, the communists, and you know, in that area, they were everywhere. So we we escaped at night. Um, we my parents hired a guide that knew you know, uh, knew where to take us to get to you know safety. So we ended up going with um, another family, and other families were too afraid to leave, so they 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 stayed. Um, so the guy took, took us in the middle of the night uh, escaping and we snuck in the stranger's house in, at nighttime or, you know, we would pay them for them, to, for us to be able to stay there, you know, to rest, to get some food. But um, we made it, we actually, when we made it through um, the escape, the whole escaping part, the most traumatizing uh, part of the escaping to me was, you know, being, like I said, six years old, I still remember this, when my brother and my younger sister got lost. Um, uh, we couldn't, we couldn't cry, we couldn't talk, we couldn't, you know, we'd be loud. So, you know, when I cried, you know, my mouth was covered. Um, I cried because I couldn't, we couldn't find my, my brother, my sister. We did eventually, fortunately, fortunately found them. And then, you know, we continued on um, towards uh, the Mekong River. We did make it to the Mekong River. The guy did take us, you know, because he knew where he was going, did take us through to um, Mekong River. And when we got to the Mekong River, that, that river is between Thailand and Laos. So when we got there, um, there was uh, a canoe, uh, just one canoe. So you say it's my mom and, you know, seven children um, that had to, you know, go across the Mekong River. And I couldn't tell you how big the Mekong River was. I just don't remember. Um, but um, I was in the, the, the canoe with my mom, my sister, my younger sister, and me. All my brothers, um, young and old, swam along the canoe. Um, we made it across the Mekong River then, um, and then we uh, went into the refugee camp, uh, refugee camp in Thailand, and it was called, um, we made it to Nong Kai. And we, when we made it in there, the worst part is, to me, is to be in the refugee camp. Um, and I'm gonna give you, you know, a scenery of what the camp is about. Uh, what it looks like. It's just a big open uh, gated area with a whole bunch of refugees, you know, families that escaped like us from Laos, you know, that, that made it across the river and is now free from the communists and free from, you know, uh, being shot and, you know, killed. Um, the whole place was fenced in, the, it was open sewer. We all slept on a concrete floor and like an open pavilion, with just concrete floor. We stood in line for um, food. And I think, and what I remember, I will never forget, and I don't think I'll ever eat it again, is um, we stood in line and the maids 
uh, meal was uh, rice and cabbage soup. And that's what basically what we had every day and every meal is what, you know, if, to this day, I won't eat cabbage soup again. Um, but, you know, fortunate to be there, you know, safe from um, Laos. My dad was outside of the uh, refugee camp by now. He made it outside. He would come and visit us. And you know, a lot in this camp, there's um, holes that you could, you know, visit the people or the family from the outside. So my dad would come and talk to us and see my mom and all of us through this, you know, little hole. And, you know, he would, he would uh, send food through the hole for us. What, that's what I remember. Um, and then, you know, my, my brother would try to, my, young, my older brother would try to escape through the hole to go see my dad through there, you know, and then he'd come back, fall in the sewer system. Some of the stuff that, you know, I will never ever forget as a six year old um, of what, you know, living in the uh, refugee camp, something I'll never forget. Um, we made it to, um, made it out of, uh, the refugee camp then, and then we um, stayed outside there. My dad got us um, like a house there. It's not, it's not really a house. It's just a bamboo structure, um, like a house made of bamboo. It wasn't um, the most appealing <laughs> uh, place to stay. We, we actually slept on the floor. Um, how we lived when we were outside of there, when, once we made it out of the refugee camp was... Um, we would sell um, to light up the, the, the houses. You need the kerosene. The kids went out and um, we uh, went around and sold kerosene. We'd yell saying, you know, kerosene, kerosene for sale. Um, my brothers would do that and I, brothers would ride bikes around. Um, my dad would um, teach uh, to get cheap money in Bangkok. And he would teach, start teaching um, school to, um, to help us uh, get food. Um, so we were there at the camp, at the Nong Thai camp in Thailand for two years. So from 1979 to 1981, we were there. And then and that's including leaving the refugee camp and staying outside um, of the camp. So we had to wait for, uh, we had a relative in Orville that was working, you know, with the churches and working with the commun community to get us, get our family there. And we had to wait for the visa so we could be into the United States um, legally. Um, it does take that long for us to, it did take us that long for us to get over here to the United States. So January of 1981, January 16th of 1981, 40 years ago, <laughs> we made it to, um, Akron Canton Airport. It was a 22 hour flight. Um, I was eight years old. It was the longest flight. I, my brother and I got sick. We vomited, you know, the whole flight. Um, pretty, pretty tired when we got off the, uh, the airplane. We were met at Akron Canton Airport with um, a family and a, from Christ United Church of Christ in Orville. And they actually had it, you know, a sign in Laotian printed, um, uh, meaning, you know, welcome to the United, United States, what was on that sign. Um, we all had um, coats on, we still had our sandals on. Um, uh, it was cold. <laughs> what I remember about that night was really cold. January 16, 1981 was very cold. We made it there, uh, hopped in the van, drove about, um, 30, 40 minutes to um, Orville. And once we got to Orville, you know, back in Laos, the climate was really warm. There was no snow or, you know, not, not, not cold. So we, uh, the, my brothers and I, my sister, my brothers and I have never seen snow before. I think what we did that whole night was, um, <laughs> we stayed outside and played in the snow. Now, I can't stand the snow, <laughs> but um, we were um, still tired, but we were met and with uh, a family from the church. Um, they got us settled. Um, the next day, they took us to church. Um, 
it, it was a, um, a story written by one of our sponsors. And I'm going to mention their name, John and Judy Krupp. I, I don't think our family would, uh, you know, be where we are now without John and Judy Krupp. Until this day, we rely on John and Judy Krupp um, from um, Church Orgo, uh, Christ United Church of Christ in Orgo, Ohio. They were the, are the main sponsors. So we um, went to um, church and, you know, in the pews of the chapel, they were donated um, piles of clothes. The church had um, different groups of um, congregation members of, that took care of us. Uh, I remember having to go to tutors um, like Mondays and Wednesday nights, you know, go to tutors. I was young. I think I started out in kindergarten not knowing uh, any English at all. Um, but <clears throat> life was pretty hard because we knew we didn't know any English. And I was um, eight years old. We went to school. My dad trudged through snow to just to take um, us to school in the morning. Um, but then we, you know, we also had church members that took care of us, you know, taking us to school, um, gave us clothing, took us uh, to get food, took my mom and my dad to, um, you know, like Cleveland or Columbus to, um, to the Asian markets so we can have, you know, our food and stuff. We had uh, church members, congregation members that, um, took care of us with employment, took my dad to go get, you know, applied for jobs, um, took us to um, do doctor's visits, uh, dental visits, um, and then we had, we even had some members that would babysit, you know, the, the younger, our younger kids. Um, fast forward now to the present, we've been, you know, with, Christ United Church of Christ for 40 years. John and Judy Krupp has helped us out a lot. The church still helps us out a lot. The community of Orville has helped us out a lot. They welcomed us with open arms. Um, I don't think I could ever, you know, I don't think we could ever repay uh, the church enough. In fact, my mom and my dad, my mom had full time uh, is janitor and was and did retire from being a janitor at our church. At, um, and then um, I uh, now am paying back the, uh, the, the community, the city of Orville, you know, I do whatever I can to help them out, you know, being on, you know, board of directors or um, alumni, um, a lot of um, just doing stuff, just like today. Today, I'm very, you know, very honored to be here to tell the story about how we got here and what uh, our church has done for us. And I don't think the church will ever um, stop doing things for us. We were very blessed and very um, fortunate to um, have um, Christ United Church of Christ in Orville here for us. Um, where we're at right now, we are, we're, we're happy. We made it. We. Um, we're here <laughs> and um, blessed to have um, such a great uh, support from um, Christ United Church of Christ in Orville. And um, I hope I've uh, told the story enough and I know I got kind of nervous, but um, I hope things, um, I hope you guys understood what uh, my whole story um, and um, that's it. And I hope if you guys have any questions for me, I would be glad to answer it. Thank you. We had just listened to the story of C.O. Conrad, who came to the United States on a refugee visa. Some Afghan immigrants will be coming over on SIV refugee visas that are similar to the experience that C.O. and her family had. However, many more will come on humanitarian parole status, which has similarities to the asylum seeking process also. The differences between asylum and humanitarian parole will be highlighted in this section. For that reason, we are also providing the story of an asylum seeker and the church that accompanied her. This is Gloriosa. 
In 2014, Gloriosa fled being nearly murdered in her country of origin, Burundi, because her husband was a radio journalist speaking out against gang violence in the country. Gloriosa was targeted for being employed by the UN and experienced extreme attacks and threats on her life that caused her to seek asylum in the United States. Unfortunately, the quality of the video wasn't strong enough to be able to let you to hear her story in her own words. But we are highlighting her because she was taken in by Woodsford United Church of Christ in Portland, Maine, when she arrived in America on asylum status in 2014. Woodsford Church helped Gloriosa get on her feet while she adjusted her status in the United States and waited for her family to join her. Much in part to her journey with Woodsford UCC, whose members she refers to as family, Gloriosa found enough love and support to eventually stabilize and settle in the Washington DC area where she lives today with her husband and children. This is the story of her pastor, Reverend Carolyn Lambert and Woodsford UCC that accompanied her and the process of how they made the decision to walk with Gloriosa and many other asylum seekers on their journeys. An honor to be asked to be here. Um, and, and I'm so grateful that we had an opportunity to see even a few clips of Gloriosa, who was an asylum seeker who wound up by coming to Woodford's, which is the church I served in Portland um, before moving to Buxton. And she had quite a journey, um, both behind her as well as before her. And I think it's really important for us to be able to see somebody who has actually come to this country with virtually nothing. And, I, and we still don't know exactly what the folks from Afghanistan are going to have when they get here. We don't even know exactly what their status is going to be. My work, especially in Portland, was primarily with the asylum seeking community. And what that meant was when we decided that we needed to offer whatever resources we had as a church and as individuals, that we had to do a lot of learning. And, and I think that there is a lot of learning that, that has to go on if we're going to be helpful uh, to people coming to this country, especially people who have left the country of their origin in distress as, as Gloriosa did. 10 years ago, we had quite a diverse community in Portland. There were well over 50 languages spoken in the high school, but almost all of the people who had come to Portland as what we call new Mainers came as immigrants. And that meant that they had visas and they had some resources and they had lots of other resources from the local community as well as from the federal government available to them. But when you come as an asylum seeker, you have virtually nothing available to, to you. And, and that's what we discovered when we started helping Gloriosa and others like her. I'm sure that by now you probably know the, the definition of an immigrant, a refugee, and an asylum seeker. But because someone who is coming and is seeking asylum, they don't have any kind of papers, they don't have any kind of visa, and they are not allowed to work. I can't tell you how many times I heard from people in the community, yeah, tell them to get a job, tell them to get a job, but they can't get a job. They're not allowed to work for months and months and months after they arrive so that they really do need resources provided for them. We wanted to do that, but we didn't necessarily know exactly how to do that because the people who had come as new Mainers prior to this um, large group of asylum seekers who started arriving about 10 years ago, they came as in immigrants, so they had resources available to them. So the first thing that we had to do as a congregation, there was already a passion in the congregation to be able to help people. But what we had to do was really learn even some of the basic language, which, what the difference was or still is between immigrants, asylum seekers, and refugees. And so we had to start at square one. Then we needed to go out and see what was available in the community. If you come as a refugee, if you come as an immigrant, you are given a lot of resources by Catholic charities. They, the, the government has... Um, uh, worked out a program with Catholic Charities, and I think all over this country, uh, in communities where um, folks from other countries are welcomed, Catholic Charities does an amazing job. But if you come as an asylum seeker, especially if you've come to a secondary city, 
you receive almost nothing in resources. So we had to start figuring out what are the resources that people need? There was a group that was starting to meet, not a, a religious group or a faith-based group, but a group of well-meaning and really good people who had already started this work. And it was just called WIN, W-I-N. And, and this group of folks, um, was trying to figure out what resources were all available in the Portland community. And they found out that there were very few resources, but we were working with them. Matter of fact, we gave them space because one of the things that we had at Woodford's was lots of space, lots of space. So we gave them space to meet and we wound up by meeting with them as well so that we can learn directly from them what resources were provided and what resources were needed. The second thing that we wound up by doing is going out into the broader community to find out what our city was actually offering. Besides having a lot of space at Woodford's, which sometimes we thought was an albatross, at other times it felt like it was a real gift, especially when we were having classes for asylum seekers. We also had a significant retired population. And while Folks who are retired may not be the ones who are moving furniture in and out of apartments. What they have as a gift is a gift of time. We also had many, many retired ministers, not just UCC, but Presbyterian and Methodist. And so we had a lot of people who had the time available to put into not only learning what was needed, but, but also providing for some of those needs. So those were two of the things that we had to offer, space and time. We also had people who were really passionate about helping. Woodford's has always had a very strong and well-developed helping network in terms of um, both justice as well as compassion kinds of assistance. So, so, so we had all of those things bubbling up. And so I think that one of the first things that everybody has to do, even as we're thinking about the Afghanis come, is, is what is it that you do have to offer? And be realistic about it. You, you can't say, well, we've got people with plenty of time if everybody's working and working hard and taking care of family. So you really need to look inside and, and discover what kinds of gifts you have to offer, even after you've looked beyond yourselves to try to figure out what is it that the community has to offer. And, and then you can begin to blend those things together. I can't say that we did everything perfectly, but we kept at it. And because there was this underlying passion for doing the kind of work that we were being called to do, that even if we made a mistake, we just turned around and, and started down another road. But I have to say that it wasn't just about us and them. It wasn't about us as members of a congregation helping them who had come to this country. We really, really also knew how important it was to actually integrate them into the community whether it was the, the, the community of Woodford's church or whether it was into the greater community. So we wound up by trying to do things like have community um, meals with people that lived in the Woodford's community or inviting other churches to join us so everybody could meet each other. I remember that, that, that on a rather cold and bitter day, we took Lena and uh, Gloriosa to the grocery store. And there were several of us that took them to the grocery store. We let them buy whatever they needed to buy so that they could cook for us. So they had an opportunity to show us something about what was important to them, what a meal would look like in Rwanda um, or Burundi or wherever they, they, they came from. I think that one, one was from Rwanda and one was from Burundi. And they were thrilled to be able to use our kitchen and cook a meal and then talk to us about what, it, what went into that to cooking that meal. And then that led to all kinds of other conversations as well. So it, so I think what's really important, again, isn't just about the resources that people need in terms of their, their physical self, uh, shelter, food, um, even, even a job, but it's also being embraced into the community. And I think one of the things that we have to all be aware of is that when 
we invite people to be part of us and part of our community, then we get rid of the derivation of us and them. Um, I, I really do believe that everybody has resources they can offer. And, and the most important thing that you're gonna do is sit down together, uh, whether it's in, in, in the wider community or whether it's in your congregation and really be serious about what it is that you have to offer. What are the gifts that you have to offer? If you live in a rural area, it may not work well to actually have people come to that area, but there's still things that you can do to make sure that the people coming to this country feel that they're wanted and they're welcomed. Can you think of a time in which your congregation was challenged, uh, that you felt like giving up, that you'd made some mistakes and how you, how you moved together past that to keep on doing the work. Do you, do you have something like that in mind? You know, I don't think that there was any one particular thing. I, 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 I guess what I would say is that, that getting legal help was really hard. And, and I don't know that we made any mistakes, but we felt that we kept going up against stone walls um, because there weren't, there, there's a group called ILAP that, that offers free assistance to Asylums, and again, I'm speaking totally about asylum seekers here. Um, it's complicated. People would have to go to Boston. They had no way to get to Boston. So we kept feeling that we were running into stone walls. We were running into barriers. And, and then we would have to do further research. And I think that sometimes that that was really tiring uh, to the folks in the congregation. But there would there was always somebody who was willing to go out beyond the church, even if they had to go out beyond the local Portland community to get the information that we needed. And, and so I think it was really a matter of just being persistent, you know, and, and I think I, I, I love the story of um, the, 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 wit, the persistent widow and the judge because she just didn't give up. And I think that that's, that's something that's really important for us to remember is that Sometimes it's going to be really hard, and sometimes it's going to feel like we're not getting far, and we're not getting far very quickly either. And yet, if we just keep at it, sometimes in a given day, we won't make any headway. And, and sometimes in a given week, we might not make any headway. But if we keep at it, and we keep looking beyond ourselves to the other resources that are available, we'll figure it out. And, 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 and we're going to figure it out with the folks coming from Afghanistan, too. Other than that, I don't think that we, we I, I don't feel that we did anything wrong. But I do feel that we were often up against these barricades. And, and it was, we had to figure out whether we could go around them or under them or over them. But eventually we did. And I think it was that persistence because people, I have to say, people were really passionate about the work that we were doing. And I think if you could do nothing else except for light a fire under people's passion for justice, it's going to make a huge difference. And then how did you keep that, that fire burning when things felt overwhelming, when you felt like you were coming up against barriers? How did the congregation re-nourish its soul and, and carry on? I think that those were the times where maybe we invited a group of new Mainers to come in and, and share a meal with us. Sharing a meal makes a huge difference, a huge difference. And there would be times that there were children that wanted to show us how to dance. And sometimes they'd say, can we bring our drums? And they'd say, could we cook the meal? I already told you about cooking a meal, but there were other times where we'd cook uh, um, food that Maine is infamous for. Um, and, and they would cook food that, that their countries and, and their homelands were infamous for, and we put it all together. I do have to tell you that I um, inadvertently gnawed on a, go a goat's hoof one time and then tried to pretend that that wasn't what I was doing. I thought it was a sweet potato, but it was actually a hoof. Um, and, and, and I don't need to talk about that. I just tried to pretend I didn't do it. So, so you know, because our, our cultures are different, we don't always understand. But if, we, if our hearts are big enough, if our hearts are open enough, then we, can, we, we you know, we recognize the fact that, that we're both going to make mistakes in that sense, and we can learn from those mistakes. 
Okay, so I want to thank uh, CEO and um, and Reverend Lambert for providing those um, really inspirational stories. So uh, next, I just want to move on to Katie and Noel, who will share with us updates on how you can advocate. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Katie Adams, and I'm the domestic policy advocate for the United Church of Christ and work in Washington doing direct advocacy with lawmakers as well as helping individuals and congregations do their own advocacy through education and resources. I'm really grateful for the powerful stories we've been able to hear and wanted to take the opportunity to share some of the advocacy options available that you and your community and congregation can take. As we've discussed right now, individuals who worked for the US government during the war, their family members are in the application pipeline for special immigrant visas, um, and many other vulnerable populations are also being evacuated and need to access and need access to resettlement services. These include allies, NGO colleagues, civil society leaders, human rights defenders, women, those in the LGBTQIA plus community, targeted ethnic and religious minority groups, and other members of at risk groups are all being evacuated and need access to the program. I think it's important to remember that a vast majority of Americans across the political spectrum support resettling vulnerable Afghans in the United States. And more than that, it's our moral obligation. While we know the Biden administration has been surging resources to make that happen by speeding up visa processing, um, there is much more that needs to be done. Most of our new Afghan neighbors are entering the United States with what we've talked about called humanitarian parole meaning they have temporary relief from immigration requirements, but that doesn't mean they're automatically eligible for refugee resettlement services. We're urging Congress to take action on several fronts, and I have two action alerts that I'll paste into the chat right now to everyone. Uh, from both the United Church of Christ and also um, the Church of our partners. So I'm gonna go over those asks right now. First, we're urging authorization for Afghans arriving on humanitarian parole to receive refugee resettlement services. This means making sure Af all Afghan parolees have access to the same resettlement services as refugees who are settled through the US Refugee Admissions Program. And those services, like we've discussed, include access to medical assistance, English language classes, housing assistance, job training, and helping children enroll in school. This means making sure our second ask is granted, which is appropriate supplemental funding to serve Afghan arrivals. This is a large scale humanitarian crisis, and we have an opportunity to ensure that there are robust pathways to, protect, to protection and help for displaced Afghans. As we welcome Afghans who have been forced from their homes, it's critical that the federal agencies who serve refugees and the communities that welcome them have the resources they need. The administration has asked for additional funding called an anomaly request. In and that government funding request includes funding for screening, resettlement operations, refugee benefits and services, and accelerating the application process for permanent resident status. It's up to Congress to approve that request. Finally, we're calling on Congress to pass an Afghan Adjustment Act. This would allow Afghan parolees to have an opportunity to seek legal permanent residence. These parolees are fleeing violence and persecution and deserve an opportunity to rebuild their lives in safety without the fear and limitations associated with an uncertain immigration status. Our demands of the administration include making sure that there is um, a humanitarian court corridor to evacuate all SIV applicants, citizens, and lawful permanent residents lawful permanent residents and other at-risk members, our communities stand ready to welcome Afghans to safety in the US. Uh, and we've offered a lot of ways that your congregation and community can offer that welcome. Um, by ensuring uh, every step of the resettlement process, we need to make sure that people are supported so they can rebuild their lives and dignity. As advocates of faith, you can help by contacting your member of Congress and the White House asking for the support I just outlined. The United Churches of Christ has an action alert as well as our partner organization, Church World Service. It's linked to in the, the chat section. 
You can also contact your state and local officials telling them to urge their support in refugee resettlement in your community by investing in community services, expressing support and coordination of refugee services and issuing proclamations of welcome for refugees. So the asks that I've talked about are federal asks of Congress, but then also, like I just said, please also contact your state and local officials to help prepare your community to be more welcoming to refugees. The deadline is also coming up for determination and how many refugees overall the United States will resettle in a given year. We're urging President Biden to set a robust refugee admissions goal for fiscal year 2022 at 200,000 people. You can also contact your member of Congress to ask the president to set a bold humanitarian goal of resettling 200,000 refugees. The previous administration did a lot to dismantle the refugee resettlement program and our country's ability to offer welcome to those who need it. But as we know, threaded throughout our sacred scripture is the ever present message of love to our neighbor and welcoming the sojourner. Any attempt to close that welcome and deny the opportunity to love our neighbors flattens the good news of the gospel into mere words and not the living, breathing gospel of Jesus. As people of faith, it's our obligation and responsibility to ensure that welcome is and ensure that welcome. And one of the ways we can do that is urging Congress and the administration to take every step needed to ensure that will happen. So I turn it over to my colleague, Noel Anderson, uh, to um, talk about some of the other organizing efforts happening. Great, thank you so much for all the amazing advocacy work you are doing in Washington, DC, Katie. And um, I know, I think I know many of you who might be on this call. Uh, my name again, Noel Anderson, and I work with the UCC National Collaborative on Immigration um, that we mainly focus on the immigrant welcoming and sanctuary congregations. I'm in an interesting role where I'm both a CWS employee that works on grassroots organizing for immigration refugee program, and I'm a UCC ordained pastor that works on immigration with the UCC. And we're very thankful that we now have Reverend Irene Hassan to lead the refugee and migration. And her and I will be working together. I'll be more on the immigration side. Um, I do work on CWS quite a bit on uh, asylum. And I think the material that has really been laid out already, the main actions that people can take, which you've seen and heard, I'm sure, are, you know, of course, financial donations. And uh, Reverend Hassan has that link for you through the UCC. Um, I know the UCC will probably be giving some to uh, CWS since we are a refugee agency. Uh, community sponsorship, all right? Um, we've talked about that in depth, which is on volunteering. Advocacy, thank you, Katie, for covering all of that. And then also the prophetic witness were, and I wanna talk just a little more about that. And that I think also overlaps with what is the local advocacy strategy. So within uh, already we're seeing uh, resolutions for welcome. We're seeing uh, city, county and state funds being allocated, uh, our representative, our Senator Kathy Tran is going to be introducing a $12 million bill in uh, for Afghans in Virginia. Uh, Governor Newsom has already introduced uh, or proposed to 16 plus million funds in California. So that type of local advocacy and uh, resolutions that many faith communities signed on to, for example, the Austin, Texas resolution, I know they're getting ready to plan a press conference. So also those prophetic witness events, whether they be virtual or hopefully safely outside in, uh, in person events that, um, you know, as we can lift up that moral voice right now, as much as we can do that in our communities and ensure that our faith communities are getting engaged and are participating, however that makes sense, whether it's an opinion editorial letter to the editor, making sure that we're impacting the public narrative is going to be uh, really critical in these moments because we do unfortunately ex expect a backlash against Afghan uh, refugees. And so getting ahead of that narrative, showing that, that in fact, 
the refugee and the asylum program are critical programs because we know we've talked about how they've been disassembled by the previous administration, how this Biden administration has failed to get the pipeline moving, has delayed the, the refugee admissions goal previously. And so we're looking at very low refugee arrivals this year. And so whatever happens with Afghan re seeking refuge right now will heavily impact both the refugee and the asylum program. When the, the Biden administration put for their supplemental funding proposal, they're saying we can welcome asylum seekers and create infrastructure for them to have case management. Yet at the border, they continue to hold up the Title 42 misuse of the health, co health code during the pandemic to try to block asylum completely. And so those things are contradictory and they're also hypocritical. We, we can create the case management infrastructure needed at the southern border. We can welcome asylum seekers. We have the capacity to do that. And so everything we're doing, all of these things tied together. Uh, at the same time, you know, we're also working on a pathway to citizenship, which I won't get into. But all of these broader uh, themes that I'm talking about is part of what it means to be an immigrant welcoming congregation. And so just a couple other resources in the chat around an immigrant welcoming congregation and also uh, top actions. Um, the getting that 200,000 is that was has been mentioned several times is going to be key this September as we come up to the signing of the presidential determination and refugee admissions goal that the President Biden should be signing by September 30th. So we're really now pushing for 200,000 which we've done before in 1980, refugees to be resettled. And that would be including what we're looking at with Afghan arrivals. So thank you so much for all the impre incredible work that everyone on this call is doing. And I'll pass it back over to Reverend Hassan. Thank you, Katie and Noel. Um, so I'm going to uh, invite Reverend Elena Larson, who's our Minister for Volunteer Engagement, to briefly speak to you about how you can form um, a responsible team uh, to engage this ministry. Good afternoon, good evening, and um, thank you all for being here. I'm going to be very brief, uh, but I know that probably you're feeling some fire in the belly. And you're thinking about how you can respond and how you can bring people together in your immediate community to respond. And so um, what Irene and I have been working on is that we'd really like to formulate a network so that, um, so that, that we have leadership on the local level so that there's always somebody you can depend on as you take on this important and very responsible and sometimes very stressful ministry. The thing that really touched my heart today as we were listening to our speakers is that the long-term commitment and the intense commitment that congregations make to their new friends is something, it's not like one day or one moment. And we know that persistence and sticking together is one of the ways we can be successful in supporting people to create new lives. So what Irene and I are looking for are, um, you know, maybe you're the person in your association or in your conference who would really like to commit to an extensive, supported, volunteer leadership experience. If you're thinking that you would like to give time over three to six months, maybe longer, to be a point person in your area, I'd like to invite you to check out the Partners in Service program. I put, the, um, I put the link right there in the chat. Partners in Service is a key part of our volunteer ministry strategy. It will allow us to network with one another to create that structure that helps people volunteer at the time and in the way that works for them. So I'm not gonna go into that much further, but um, what I'd like you to know is we will be in touch with you to let you know how things come along. And we are looking for folks who have the energy to coordinate others, um, to support one another and make sure that the long-term commitment doesn't get dropped over time. Conference and association staff, I saw some of you checking in on the side, just a special note to you. I don't mean you, but what I'd like from you is if you have some 
your conference or association who has passion and skill to do this work, please nominate them to us. And that way we can create a network that can really sustain a ministry that touches lots of lives, including our own. So thank you all for being here. Um, I'm gonna drop some more info in the chat, but let's create a network that can sustain this ministry and create a lot of change for a lot of people. Okay, thanks Irene. And thank you everyone for being here. It's been an amazing afternoon. Thank you, Elena. So I really want to honor um, the time because I know that it's Saturday and some of us have to wake up for church tomorrow. And uh, also, um, you know, it's Saturday. <laughs> so I know I said that we're going to be answering all these questions. The thing is that I, because I want to honor this time, I'm just going to keep these questions and I'll answer them um, in the email that we send you that has all this information in it. So that has all these links, that has this PowerPoint, so you have it for later. And I'll also answer these questions in the email. However, um, if there's any questions for CO, um, while she's still here, uh, I think that I saw one for CO. Um, you had a question from uh, Elaine Scotton who said, um, CO, what are, what are you doing now? What's your, what's your family doing? And also Linda Woods asked, what kind of work did your dad find here? It sounds like your mother worked as a janitor and thank you for sharing so much with us. So see if you could answer what's, what's going on with your family now. Okay, um, I, we are all still in Orville. Um, my brothers and sisters, my mom, my dad passed away two years ago. Um, but we, uh, I, I am right now actually have been fortunate not to, uh, you know, be able to work as much. <laughs> Um, we have a, um, my husband has a machine shop. So I just go in and help at the shop whenever it's needed. My brother has his own um, welding um, shop also. So, and then, you know, all the other siblings are, you know, they, they either have their own little uh, company or their own little, um, you know, their, their, their job that they enjoy doing. Um, my dad was a machinist. In fact, my husband right now was his boss back in, back in Orville. He was a machinist until he retired in, um, at the age of 72. He didn't want to stop working. So we, um, we had to ask him and make him stop working, retire. So he enjoyed, he enjoyed his machine work really well. So Great, thank you so much, CEO. And we so much appreciate you taking the time to come and tell your story. It's a powerful story and we appreciate you. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and wish you all blessings. Um, I will, we will be sending you all, again, all the links in the PowerPoint in an email. And if you are watching this as a webinar, afterward, um, because this will be available on the webinar page and you were not attached to the email that, that was given to registrants, email me. And um, Becca's gonna go ahead and drop my email in the chat, if you don't mind, Becca, please. Um, just so, well, I guess you can't see the chat if it's on webinar. Hassan I at ucc.org is my email. Email me. My job is to be here for you in order for you to create healthy ministries for refugee and migration services. And so is uh, Reverend Larson's job. So is Reverend Anderson's. So is Katie's. All of us are here for you to make sure that you thrive and that the people you're serving are thriving as well. Blessings and um, have a lovely Sunday morning tomorrow. Bye.